This is Barbara Slave, and I'm interviewing Bill Conley as part of the Veterans Oral History Project, the Morse Institute Library, on April 12, 1999. Um, hello. Hello there. Uh, just for the record, uh, could you tell me um, what your age is? Uh, 77, 77, as of February 12th. Okay. And what is your address? Okay. Natick. Okay. And where were you born? Brooklyn, New York. Oh. And were you raised in Brooklyn? No, I, I was raised and went to school in, in uh, New Jersey, uh, uh -huh. Teaneck and Clifton, New Jersey. Uh -huh. When did you come to Natick? Uh, after the war, about oh, okay. 1947. Yeah. They drove me out of New Jersey. I, oh, run out of town, huh? <laughs> Okay. May, uh, may I ask what your family background is? Uh, Irish Catholic on both sides, as I remember. Uh, my uh, uh, grandparents were all born in the United States, but I understand my uh, my maternal grandmother was uh, was born on a ship uh, uh, coming from Ireland uh, in uh, eighteen. I don't know what year, but but mostly we were, uh, I guess, all mostly citizens. Right. And when, uh, for the record, what branch of the service were you in? I was in the Navy. Navy. And may I ask when you entered? October uh, 1940. And why did you happen to join the, how did you happen to join the well, Navy? Well, uh, the, the war, had, I just got out of high school and, and I was 18 years old. The war had been going on in Europe for about a year by then and I figured we'd probably eventually we'd be involved and I, I, I wanted to, uh, as I remember, uh, be able to uh, have some kind of a background experience and if, if we did get into it. So uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, as I said, I was 18 years old and uh, I didn't uh, know what I wanted to do and that sounded like it made sense at the time. Uh, so you joined before Pearl Harbor. Yes, yes, it was over a year before the war started. Yeah. Did you find that um, that was a popular thing to do to join at that time? Well, uh, actually, at my age, it didn't it, it didn't matter. But uh, what what had what caused a lot of people to volunteer into the Navy was they had just started the draft mm -hmm. just before then, and and a lot of these fellows you had to be 21 to be drafted. But a lot of these fellows, I think, that went into the Navy because they didn't want to get drafted and go in the army. Right. But to me, it didn't matter because I, you know, I just, I just was a adventurous idiot, I guess, at the time. I don't. Know. Why would the Navy be considered preferable to the Army? Well, my father was in the Navy in World War One, and he, he, he went from a seaman. He, he, he got a commission as ensign, and, and when the war ended, he was a lieutenant junior grade. So it was kind of a, a family background kind of a thing then that. I, I guess I always, that's all I ever heard about was the Navy. I, I had originally, I had talked about in the, go, I hope nobody, no Marines are going to listen to this thing. I had thought about joining the Marines, but he talked me out of it. He said, those guys are idiots. All they do is, is walk around in their fancy uniforms and guard the ships and things like that. He said, you don't want to do that. So, now, that, now, if there's any Marines listening, it's, it's all in fun, fellas. <laughs> May I ask where you did your basic training? Well, it was a combination of uh, what they had, they just started in, uh, uh, it was a combination of, uh, of, of basic training and, and radio school in Neuroton, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. It was an old, uh, old soldier's home that the, uh, the Navy took over and they refurbished it and they, they uh, uh, we were the first class that, uh, that, uh, that attended there. And as I said, a lot of the, these fellows that went there were draft age and that's why they they jumped in to get to get this instead of in the, the army so how did you get selected for radio school well it seemed like a good opportunity I didn't really know that I wanted to do that but it seemed like a good chance you can go here you know and do this all at the same time and uh, you'll, you'll know you'll have some kind of a, a, a trade or whatever did you develop any um, close friendships during basic training yeah, there was a lot of fellows that we, we, we got friendly with. There was, was a several months course at the time we were there. And a lot of them were uh, 
assigned to those, a lot of some of those battleships that were sunk in the attack on Pearl Harbor and the, the, when the war started a year later. Some of them didn't get off of them. Mm. But uh, it was a different you know, lifestyle from a kid just out of school and all of a sudden associated with a, a lot of more mature people and, and uh, routine and discipline and stuff like that. Could you tell me what a radio man does? Well, the first thing you had to do was learn Morse code, one of the things, and that was a, a very hard thing for me, and and, then you, and I couldn't type either. You have to, the radio, you have, Navy, you have to type. So t learning typing, radio, and then all the radio theory and uh, things like that were uh, a little little difficult. But once once I mastered the Morse code, I, I I, I progressed very well, and I, I never lost it. I can still, yeah. I talk to myself in Morse code sometimes. <laughs> I'm a little idiot. <laughs> now, how does that differ from the people who operated sonar and radar? What do you call them? Would they well, also be radio men? No, that, that was a different branch. At the, of course, at, the, at this time, radar, we didn't even have radar in 1940. Mm -hmm. They just, it just right. came in. We got it from the British, I guess. Yeah. And, and, but that was a different, uh, a different style, and that radar, that sonar was a, a more of a sound. Uh, I guess uh, I, I didn't really know, so they they were different, all different mm -hmm. branches. Now, where were you first stationed? Well, I got on the uh, assigned to the aircraft carrier Lexington mm -hmm. CV two in Pearl Harbor, and, and uh, uh, CV CV is a designation of aircraft carrier, and the number two was the ship's uh, number. We were the second aircraft carrier in the United States Navy. And, and now, uh, last July, the Harry S. Truman CVN-75 mm -hmm. was just put in commission. The, the N is a, stands for nuclear powered. And the, and the USS Ronald Reagan is under construction and it'll be commissioned in 2002, if we're still around. And, 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 but that shows you how many, mm -hmm. how far we progressed from CV2 to 76. <laughs> but there's a few years in between, too. Now, when, uh, when did you arrive and leave Pearl Harbor, roughly? What was the time period? Well, we, we uh, I reported aboard there about, must have been early spring in 1941. Mm -hmm. And we, we, every, Periodically, we'd, we'd go in and out of there and do maneuvers or mm -hmm. f training, flight training, and, and uh, different ba fleet battle problems. And so we did that up until the war started in, in uh, December 7th. We left, we left Pearl on uh, Friday, December the 5th, uh, 1941. We had a squadron of Marine dive bombers that we were, uh, were taking to, they were, they were, they were going to be stationed at Midway Island about. Mm -hmm about a thousand miles north, uh, northwest of uh, Pearl. And we were supposed to be in the afternoon, early afternoon that Sunday, we were supposed to be in range so we could launch them and they'd fly in and be based there. But at eight o'clock in the morning, we got the message of the air raid on Pearl Harbor. And, and so we, we put them down in, there in a hangar deck and armed our planes and started a search, but the uh, for the Jap, Jap fleet, nobody knew where they came from. The, and the, mm -hmm. the orders we get received were rendezvous with the carrier Enterprise, which was coming back from Midway Island, uh, from Wake Island. They had just uh, left a, a, a squadron of Marine fighter planes at Wake Island, and they were headed back into Pearl. But they luckily, the weather was rough. They would have been in there that Sunday, but they were delayed with the rough weather, the destroyers that they're, Supporting the destroyers, they couldn't uh, couldn't keep up the speed, so they had to slow down. And luckily, they they, they weren't in there. So we said we were ordered rendezvous with them, search out and destroy the <laughs> the enemy fleet. They didn't even know, but they said this, from the number of planes, it had to be a very sizable force. Mm -hmm. And they said they must have came through the Jap-controlled islands, the Marshalls and the Caroline Islands, way to the southeast. And they said, search, that's where they must be going back that way. Or maybe they're, they're building up to come back and do another attack, maybe even a landing. They didn't, nobody knew what was, was very confused at the time. So we searched for about a 
several days and we found some submarines, but we never found them because they came from the north and they went back that way. Did you manage to sink the submarines or you just spot them? I think, I think our planes attacked some. I don't know right. if they sank any, but... Uh, so you were really two days out of Pearl Harbor on your way to Midway when yeah. the attack happened. Yes. Were you uh, surprised when you heard about the attack? Oh yeah, we, we couldn't imagine. We, we, we had uh, always been uh, figured that we were, uh, the, the, the Japs were gonna do something because against us. But what the thinking was they would attack the Philippines and the Far East and all that. And, and then we'd go and uh, uh, the, the, our, our, the battle force, and uh, we'd go over there and we'd beat them up. Yeah. You know, it was a very fancy thoughts we had there, but we never, uh, nobody in the, in the world ever expected they could come that far to attack Pearl Harbor and sink all those battleships in there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a bit of a shock, you might mm -hmm. say. And we were very angry when we said, uh, how could they do this to us? <laughs> but it was, uh, we recovered. What was your next stop after that? Did you uh, go well, to Midway? Well, we came back into we came back into Pearl about the 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 Friday the, okay. the, the, the Friday of the, the week when the attack, and we and when we we didn't know what the, when we saw all the damage and the and the wrecks the, the, all the ships all sunk and destroyed and all and, and as I said I thought as we cruised around the harbor to, to go to our mooring on the far side of the of the uh, Fort Island where the what they called battleship road, the battleships all tied up on on the on the closer side to the fleet landing and we, we tied up on the on the far side usually our mooring was always there. And as we cruised went by to circle the island and we went by all these sunken battleships and all I was thinking was these guys my, some of my funny friends that we went to school with, were radio school, they were in those mm -hmm. things, you know, and it was kind of gave me a bad feeling. Yeah. Did you take photographs or keep a diary no, of what you saw? No, couldn't have cameras. You weren't supposed to have right. cameras. I did keep a kind of a diary, but it, it lost it when the ship was sunk. Oh. But then, then after after that, we uh, we supposedly formed a, a, a support force. The, the Marines on Wake Island were. Uh, and 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 but the change of command was going when Admiral Kimmel was the the the, the commander of Pacific Fleet and at the time of the attack and they they uh, immediately put him out of command and they put another ad, uh, admiral in charge temporarily till Nimitz was was eventually would come there but uh, as we built up this plan to attack to help the Marines on Wake Island this admiral that was in charge of it he he, he kind of chickened out of it, so they, they canceled the whole thing. So th then after that, we just kept going in the South Pacific and uh, trying to stop the Japs from landing on all these uh, Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands and, 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 uh, uh, and New Guinea, and we just kept, but we weren't, we weren't strong enough to do much. We just mm -hmm. did some damage, but we couldn't stop mm -hmm. them. So where did you go from, when you returned to Pearl Harbor, where did you go after that? Well, that's what we did. Yeah, what, you did, but why don't we just, just enumerate them if you would. Where did you go first after Pearl Harbor? Well I guess the first yeah. the first few weeks we just kept kept uh, patrolling to make sure that they weren't coming back again and we, we uh, spent a lot of time doing that and then then we built up to uh, go and support the, the Marines on Wake Island and yeah. that fell through and then we finally started to go down to the South Pacific and fight their uh, landing attempts. When you were, uh, and you're always on an aircraft carrier, w what sort of combat did they engage in, aside from being a, a place where the aircraft could land? What, what sort of fighting would an aircraft carrier see? Well, our, our plane was the main weapon, so right. we, we, as I said, we tried to attack their landing forces and, on, uh, as they tried to take over some of these these different island places and, and uh, they, they dropped bombs, torpedoes and attacked them. The, the ship itself was actually hardly ever involved except for submarines that, which the destroyers in our right. group protected us from. Uh, we, we were attacked one time with uh, Lieutenant Butch O'Hare at the Medal of Honor. He, when we, one of the, uh, uh, we were trying to attack the uh, Japs landing in uh, 
uh, Rabul at the Solomon Islands. They had just established a base there, and we were supposed to go in and and att and, and try to damage them. But the day before, we were close enough to do the attack. Their their long range planes found us, and re we heard that they reported them, and then. Our combat air patrol shot them down, but they still sent out a, a, a flight of uh, a squadron of, uh, of uh, heavy bombers to attack us. And, and this Butch O'Hare was, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he, he's a, got a Medal of Honor because he shot down five of them by himself. Mm -hmm. And that was quite a, you know, and this was, this was in February 1942 when everything was really dreary downhill. We were losing everything all yeah. over everywhere, and that was a, one bright spot. So that he, uh, President Roosevelt gave him the Medal of Honor, and he was a big celebrity for flying off our ship. <laughs> oh, that's great. Were you ever attacked by kamikaze pilots? Well, yeah, they didn't start doing that uh, much until later in the war. Although, in the uh, at this same attack, when O'Hare shot these planes down, and the other the other combat they were shooting them down too. Two of the damaged planes tried to crash us, tried to crash the Lexington, but that was that was rare in the early days. They started in by 1944, late 44 and 45. That was they were desperate by then, and that was their main one of their main weapons. They had lost most of their carriers by then, and they were just they didn't know how to they didn't have to know how to land. They just could take off because they weren't they weren't supposed to land. They were supposed to land on top of one of our ships. So it, it got a little uh, a little uh, made you a little nervous, you might say. If, uh, after a while. Could you tell me about the day that the Lexington was sunk? Well, that was the, in the, uh, they, they call it the Battle of the Coral Sea. The Jap forces were trying to uh, establish a base on Port Moresby, New Guinea, on the south coast of New Guinea, which was across the Coral Sea from, from Australia. And I guess the, 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 the top brass, whatever you call them, but the thinking was they, they might, if they could build up a base there, they might eventually try to attack Australia. So we, we heard about this. I guess they had broken their code, and, and, and we did get a lot of good information, I guess, from the, the intelligence people in, in, uh, in, in Hawaii. And so the York, Carrier Yorktown and, and the Lex and their task forces were sent to uh, break up this uh, invasion force, so we the first day we we sank this aircraft carrier that they that was supporting their their transports and forced them to turn back. And then the second day, they had two other carriers that were supposed to be supporting this force, but they were delayed to get there. Mm -hmm. And then we found them, and they found us. We were about a hundred miles apart, and and our planes attacked them at the same time they attacked us, and we damaged the both of them, but they. Did so much damage to the Lexington that it, it eventually we had abandoned ship after the fires inside got out of control several hours later. Tell, tell me about the moment that you what it was like to abandon ship and how you knew that you had to learn to you had to abandon ship. Well, we it was as I said it was several hours after the attack we were hit with bombs and torpedoes and and uh, but we thought we had the thing under control and and. Uh, Except there were fires going inside that they, they uh, that, that uh, the gasoline lines evidently were ruptured. The aviation gasoline lines and the fumes were seeping out into all these compartments, and and uh, uh, evidently a, a, a generator spark ignited some of the the fumes and set started to set off explosions way down inside of the ship, and it, it, the explosions got worse, and then the fires got out of control. We eventually lost all power, and uh, that was we didn't abandon ship till it was after four o'clock in the afternoon. The attack was like eleven thirty in the morning, but uh, eventually they we lost the power. They couldn't put the fires out, and the, the captain told everybody to get off. So we uh, we we had to go in the water. In the water, I mean, with, with in boats or no, no, no. They had. They had these lines with uh, big manila lines with with knots tied. I don't know how they ever made these things, but there was a common thing that would, with knots about every several feet. So you'd, you'd they had hung the line. They were dropped all along the side of the ship, and you'd climb down, slide your feet 
till you caught one knot below and you'd hold on to the knot above with your hands and then, then you'd, you'd hold that knot with your feet and, and slide yourself down till you could get another and you went down like that. It was about 50 feet to the water from the flight right. deck. And then what? Well, then, then we had these K-Pak life jackets and somehow on the way down, I, I didn't have, it had a lot of ties on it that you tied it together like a big shoestrings. And rubbing on the, the line, I guess going down, I must, evidently didn't have the, the, uh, the things tied that well. And so as I lowered myself into the water, the life jacket started to float away from me. And, and uh, luckily my two, two buddies, that we all stuck together and we went off the ship together and they had gone down first. They, they, they grabbed me and threw me in there. There was some of these big life rafts up against the side of the ship. So then I tied the thing up good, but we couldn't get away. I don't know why we did it, but we went off. The, the ship was listed very, very badly on the port side where that's where all the torpedoes hit. And that's the side we went off. And we couldn't get away from the, from the side of the ship. And uh, uh, there was a whole bunch of life rafts tied up all up and down the whole side of the ship. And, and uh, the destroyer came around the stern and we started to yell at him to shoot us a line. He said they'd shoot us a line, we tie it on and then they could pull the rafts away. And mm -hmm. he fired a couple of, sh and they kept falling short. And all of a sudden, there was a terrific explosion up, up forward. It blew out, I guess it was a hatch by the quarter deck, it must have been. A, and a big sheet of flame, and these guys in these rafts are all just right underneath there. And this big sheet of flame shot out over their heads. And I must have blacked out because the next thing I knew, I was, I was on that all by myself. There were these rafts with, with oh, dozens and dozens of people there. And the next thing I knew, they, they were all gone, and I was just all there by myself. They, and, they and were killed? No, they, oh. what I found out later was they, they, they just started swimming. They jumped on, they swam away and got clear. And, and I, I must have fainted or I don't know what because I don't even know how long I was, but there was nobody there except me. Oh. And uh, then the ship was really started to explode be over my head. And, and the next thing I knew when I can't swim, mm -hmm. I was about 100 feet away from the ship swimming like a, like a motorboat. And, and the, 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 uh, the, 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 the explosions were going to have blown up the, the flight deck. There were pieces of airplanes and deck splashing in the water all around me. And I kept going. <laughs> and I, uh, eventually, uh, the cruise in New Orleans was, was way off, laying way off. And they had their boats in the water. And the, well, we had quite a few ships with us. And they had their boats in the water and New Orleans boat picked me up finally brought me on the wow. that's my favorite ship the, the New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> it's no wonder <laughs> so that was uh so what was your next uh then i got on this next uh duty after that. this uh, block island the cve 21 escort carrier was about wasn't even half the size of the lexington this was a lexington was a gigantic ship and we uh that's where we went in the atlantic hunting submarines with the a uh, hunter killer group and and we were credited with sinking about eight of them over about a year until the final the 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 one we were supposed to kill turned into the hunter and killed us it, with uh, hit us with three torpedoes and and blew the stern off of the one of the destroyer escorts with another torpedo it was it was really a to this day, do you know the uh, name of the U-boat that shot you down? Yeah, no, but, shot you I, down. but I don't, I don't yeah. remember the number we have. <laughs> but they, the DEs, the other DEs sank them as we were, we, we had a bad, this thing was breaking in half. It was, they, they weren't very well made. They were mass produced and they were made out of like heavy tin foil or something. They couldn't stand it. And it was broken, it was breaking in half and we had abandoned ship. And the DEs, couple, two DEs picked us up and the other one sank the, sank the sub at the same time, so the, that was a uh, look. And then they, then they, they, the other one told the, 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 the damaged DE and, and the, the two that picked the survivors up, we went into Casablanca and Morocco and uh, mm -hmm. then they brought us back to the States eventually from there. Mm -hmm. You said DE, is that destroyer escorts? Destroyer escorts, okay. yeah. So you were on an aircraft carrier and then you had destroyer escorts and what other, and you had planes, of course, what other 
what other um, equipment would there be besides the aircraft carrier, the destroyer escorts, and the planes? Would that be it? Yeah, that's about right. the, that's about the size of it. Yeah. And the submarines were were sunk by the airplanes. Pretty much. Well, a combination. The air, airplanes would uh, locate them uh, uh, sometimes on the surface, mm -hmm. and then. Usually they if they 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 try to attack them, but the submarines as soon as they saw them they try to submerge, and they drop. They had depth charges, and eventually we had some kind of rockets that they could fire at them too. If they didn't sink them, they'd call in the destroyer escort, and and they they try to attack them, dropping depth charges or something. We had quite a f different experiences with the DEs. Did a lot of the a lot of the work. Who was your admiral at that time in the Atlantic? Well, we just had a, a, the captain of the ship was the, fir the first captain was uh, Logan Ramsey, uh, and he was uh, relieved by uh, Admiral uh, Francis Massey Hughes. That's an unusual name, Massey Hughes. Mm -hmm. They were both, and this was in, in 1944, but they were both in, uh, p pilots in Patrol Wing 2 that operated from Fort Island in Pearl Harbor, and, and, and Ramsey at that time was a, command, a lieutenant commander, and he's the one that was credited with sending that message at the, when the Japs attacked the air raid on Pearl Harbor. This is no drill. And he, so he became then the, uh, as he went through, and he was eventually captain of the first block island, and mm -hmm. Hughes was a, a pilot in that same patrol wing two squadron. That mm -hmm. search for the Japs all all the next day they sit in his pajamas, <laughs> in one of those PBY flying uh, boats. So he was the captain. Uh, uh, Hughes was the captain when the ship was sunk, and then then he was he became the captain of the second block island when they put almost the, the same crew on on mm -hmm. on that one after uh, after that. What were some of your most memorable communications that you did in Morse code? Well, I guess I didn't copy that message, but I, I saw it as I as I sounded battle stations on December the 7th. As I came into the radio room, I saw this guy was copying that message. I read on <gasps> Pearl oh, really? Harbor. This is no drill. <laughs> and, and then uh, our our sighting planes, when when uh, when when the the uh, scout planes found the Jap task force at the Coral Sea, and I, and I, I copied the message, the sighting report that he sent enemy. In sight, and they gave the yeah. gave the list of the ships and the lo the position and the course and speed and all of that. That was in Morse code because the voice radio went over a hundred miles. It didn't work too well, and this was yeah. beyond that range. So we sent it in, in Morse code, yeah. so you could you could receive it much better than the voice. The static and everything would break it all up after long distance. What was a typical day like in your life? As a radio man on board oh, an aircraft carrier, it was carrier. kind of routine, yeah. dependent on each, as I as I went on these. As I got more responsibility, and the last ship I was on, I was kind of the, I was the leading petty officer, I guess, of the radio, of, of the radio division, and I kind of had to make the watch list, check the traffic, handle the traffic, and uh, copy the, uh, I copied press. Civilian press and 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 edited and made up the ship's newspaper and as we you know as we went along if things changed that was a, I was pretty busy by then doing all that those things there but at first it was a, kind of a just a dull routine you'd copy messages and send messages and uh, <laughs> could you tell me about the day that the Block Island was sunk and what what it was like to abandon that ship. Well, I, I was the. Uh, it was in the evening. I was the. Uh, I was. I was a supervisor of the evening watch in the radio room. We stood. We stood radio watches, kind of funny hours. Most of the ship they stood four-hour watches, but we we uh, radio watch would go like from noon time till supper, uh, supper till midnight, midnight till breakfast. It was long hours, and and so. The evening watch was. I was. I was a supervisor in the radio room in the evening watch it, uh, and it was about eight o'clock at night when we didn't. We knew we were trying to find this submarine, but we lost contact with it. And 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 about eight o'clock, all of a sudden, this 
two torpedoes hit us without any any warning at all. One hit near the bow, one hit near the stern, and and the whole everything in the radio room went flying all over. The type I had a typewriter on my desk went flying over there, and the message blanks were flying all around. And and uh, then I guess he hit that DE with another. Then he come back and hit us with the third torpedo right in the right in the middle, because the ship was breaking. They sounded general quarters. But by the time these people came to man their battle stations, the, the, we, we were just about losing power. So uh, we finally had abandoned, they passed the word abandoned ship while the thing was breaking in half. And we had to come out, the radio room was right under the flight deck on the, on the side where the t torpedoes hit on the, on the uh, starboard side, and, uh, or port side, I guess. And uh, the radio room, we came out of the radio room, went up, across the flight deck to abandon ship on the on the far side. And as we went by, there was a, the doctor and several people were trying to free this man. He had the torpedo hit and he was standing on the edge of the flight deck and the, the blast from the torpedo pinned him with, it rolled up the catwalk and it was, his, his leg was pinned onto the, onto the flight deck and, and they, they, they tried to cut it, cut the stuff away with a, welding torch, but they couldn't, so it was when we went by to go to the other side, the, the doctor was cutting the poor guy's leg off because oh. they couldn't get him free. He died. He couldn't. Oh. And so they left him there because they, they got to get off. Right. Yeah. So it was, uh, that wasn't very pleasant, and luckily they, there was enough there that they didn't need any more help. They said, keep going. We don't need you. Yeah, no, okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh. So that wasn't too nice, but... Okay. So where did they send you after the that ship was sunk? <laughs> well, then they, they they took us to back to the states eventually, right. and uh, we got new clothes and we got thirty days leave, I guess, and then then we went to the back to the to the west coast. They were building this other ship. They changed the name to Block Island. And that number was CVE uh -huh. one hundred six. Uh -huh. By that, from twenty one went to one hundred six. Right. So they had built quite a few, but a lot of them that they built in between the, that time they gave to the British. So the British Navy had quite a few of these mm -hmm. things. And where did you go in the second Block Island? Well, we, 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 I don't know how we managed to be so lucky, but we, we got that thing in commission just in time to take part in the in Okinawa campaign. It was near the end of the war when, the, when we were right at Okinawa, right near the the home islands and, and Formosa was nearby and they could fly those kamikaze planes down mm -hmm. no problem from either way. So we, we, we were there for the whole campaign and, and it was uh, was kind of a little hairy you might say uh, with uh, we had been going to battle stations all the time and uh, in between uh, we st stand in our long watches and, and we didn't get much sleep and we finally got so exhausted it was one of those planes that crash into us so we could get the hell out of here. You know, just don't do too much damage or just hit us on the on the bow maybe or something. So <laughs> those were the kamikaze planes, a lot of them and, and on the Oh yeah, they, they were, they, there was every, every day there were, uh, a lot of them didn't get get to, to where we were because right. the poor guys on the, what they called the radar picket ship line, they had destroyers strung out way up to the north of the island picking up as, uh, on their radars as the these things were coming down, and then you'd hear them. They, they, they we had a, on a, on our speak one of the speakers we had on, in the radio room. And this is raid number fifteen, and they tell you how many planes there were and the course they were taking. But as they were going by, these poor guys, some of them would just crash into the destroyer picket ships up there. They, they, they were that was bad up there. Mm -hmm. I was glad I wasn't on one of them. Uh, you didn't actually. Uh the Navy men didn't actually go on land in Okinawa, did they? Uh, no, I guess, well, the corpsmen, the, Navy, the Marines had Navy corpsmen that were okay, with so them all the, the time. The they, Marine, they, but the, the actual okay. sailors, well, we didn't. Uh, right. what, but what we, I think what they did have, though, was one of these islands to the south, Karamaretto, it had a, a really nice anchorage, and they, they set up a, uh, all kinds of supply ships, repair ships, and everything, and every week, there was six carriers, six of these escort carriers in our group, and every day one of them would go down there 
to replenish, rearm the ammunition and re replenish. And that's where those kamikazes were going down there all the time. And so there was a lot of sailors around there. They had they had patrol planes, and, and there was a lot of sailors on the island. But they don't, there was Japs, snipers, and things there, but they weren't really a lot of action. Mostly on the, the, the big island, Okinawa, was all Army and Marines that were doing the actual ground ground fighting. And w did you hear about all of our losses as they were happening? We lost a lot of men in Okinawa. Did they keep you abreast of that, or is that something you learned? I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I don't. As I said, I, I copied the press and made the right. newspaper. But I, I think it was more important. These guys wanted to know what the baseball scores were, and, mm -hmm. and <laughs> they knew we were getting beat. I mean, we weren't getting beat, but we knew we were getting casualties. But I don't think, yeah. uh, as long as it wasn't us, I don't think we were too concerned about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's well, kind of, well. kind of not a nice way to think, mm -hmm. but. The, you think about yourself first, I guess. Yeah. Where were you uh, when um, the Hiroshima and the Nagasaki bombs were dropped? We were. Uh, we had just come back. We we uh, after after the Okinawa campaign, we we were sent down to uh, Balak Papan, Barneo's big oil fields there. That and the Australians were were landing there, and we supported their landing and. I guess we were on the way back from there at, at when we heard the uh, about those bomb things, and we didn't. It, the details weren't that well. We didn't know. We figured we we're going to have to invade Japan in the fall. Was what they were. We, we were staging in the Philippines. They were building up to do that, and we, we didn't. Have, we weren't looking forward to that too too well. But uh, so when they finally, we couldn't believe it when they said. The Japs surrendered because we never expected that uh, that would ever happen till a couple of years, maybe, yeah. the way it looked. And that was uh, we we were uh, we were in between. So I forget where we were, but we were at sea somewhere when they announced the surrender. And it, and and the captain passed the word, everybody not on watch, get up on the flight deck. And we got and we were going through a rain squall. It was oh, you never you never could believe it, it was raining so hard. And everybody on the ship was up there, and we always carried beer on the ship. But you could never drink it on the ship. It was like if we'd go stop at an island, they'd have a little, little uh, uh, excursion, and you could give you two cans of beer. But this way, they had all the tables, the mess tables were set up on the flight deck. They had all these cases of beer, and the captain said, now, this is un, un, illegal to do this on a naval vessel, but don't tell anybody about it. And the guys were opening those cans of beer. We had a kind of a corny band. They were band was playing. These idiots were running around in the, in the pouring rain. <laughs> it was it was really something else. Hey, we think we're gonna be we're gonna stay alive. You know? <laughs> so after the war ended, uh, what did you do? Well, I I. Um, a lot of guys stayed in, but my two buddies that stayed in, they did 20-some years in the Navy, but, mm -hmm. but I, I, I couldn't stand it. I said, i got to get out of this thing. And, and actually what I did was I, I spent almost a whole year uh, recovering my senses or whatever. And mm -hmm. I had saved a lot of money, and I sent it on. My mother put it in a bank for me, so every, every week I'd say, well, how much do I need for beer for this to last me through the week? And i go to the bank and draw out. Take whatever it was, and, and I guess I was driving my poor mother crazy after a while. But I just couldn't uh, seem to get settled into uh, this normal routine. It didn't seem to, you know, it didn't seem right. And it took me a long time to get. They had a thing they called the 5220 Club. It was the government. I don't know how the hell they set this up, but the government would give all these guys that discharge veterans. Uh, $20 a week to help them get back on their feet for a year. So that was where the 52, 20, 20 dollars a for and a lot of these guys took advantage of that. They weren't looking for a job; they just were doing like. But I said, I'm not looking for a job, and I, I, I wouldn't, I didn't accept that. I said, I got all my own money. I'm gonna, I, I'm, I'm, I'm independent or something. I don't know. So I, I never did that, but a lot, a lot of them did. I don't know how they ever, you know, then they started that GI with the mm -hmm. education and they, a lot of things they did were, uh, I guess, pretty good. But I, I don't think that was good because most of these guys took advantage of that. 
They just said, well, I'm not going to work for a year. I'm going to get $20 a week. And you know, there was a lot of dough in those days. I mean, not a lot, but not to, like now it's nothing. But, you know, that was 45, 46 was different. Dollar was worth something. Yeah. I heard you um, eventually were in the Korean War, too. Yeah, I, I somehow, uh, when I was, but when I was getting discharged after the after World War One or two, uh, I must have signed up in the inactive reserve, and I didn't even know it. I didn't even know I did it because the inactive reserve, you did nothing. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, when the Korean thing started, I come home one Friday, and oh, it was a horrible day. It rained all day. It was miserable. I was in construction business out there, all muddy and chuck. Boy, I'm going home and have a couple of beers and relax. I get home and there's a letter from the first naval district, the third naval, the first naval district in Boston, right? Report to the Fargo building. You're recalled to active duty. I said, what the heck is this? I didn't know. So that, that's what it was. I, I, back in most of my, I had a lot of my same uniforms and things that I, and I had them all in a, sea bag or something and they most of them fit so you could draw a whole new outfit but whatever you didn't draw they, they'd give you equivalent money equivalent so I didn't have to get too many new things so I got a few bucks or, you know like a bonus or something. <laughs> what year was this? That was uh, 1951 the, the, the thing had been going for a while oh, okay. but they then they started recalling these these inactive guys. The ship I went on eventually that it was the Estes, the AGC-12, was an amphibious command ship, and it was all communications. And, and a good part of the, the radio men on there, there was, there was a lot of them, were, were guys like me, inactive reserves, and a lot of them, they, they, were, they, they should have left them home because they were useless. Mm -hmm. What kind of ship was it, though? What, was, the, was this a, not an aircraft carrier? Amphibious command amphibious ship, they command. called it, okay. yeah. And where in Korea were you? Well, we went, uh, uh, we ended up in, and mostly we, our home port was Yokosuka, Japan, and we'd go in Incheon Harbor, and we just stayed in Incheon. We never saw any action. We just stayed in Incheon Harbor, and we, it was communications. We handled all the, okay. handled all the communications for the, uh, all, uh, everybody in the area. We had, it was interesting, we had radio teletypes. I had never seen, be seen them before. I guess they had them. On some of the some of the other ships during the war, but we didn't have on a carrier, and and we had a lot of them. We had, oh, uh, uh, the, the radio room was as wide as the whole ship it was about 50 feet wide. The radio that was the whole width of the radio, room. and we had some marine radio men and a few army guys, and it was interesting. A lot of these different newer things that I hadn't seen, you know, over just over for five or six years, but so it was kind of interesting, but it was the same. Uh, discipline nonsense that the way they, <laughs> I, can, you know, that I was I was I finally got used to being a civilian and I had to start it back all over again. <laughs> it was kind of hard to get. I was older, and <laughs> but I, I I I did a I, I did a good job. I think I did. I know I did. But that's. Were you doing a different kind of? Uh, radio transmission in Korea. Was well, I was I was a, I was a supervisor. One of the one of the radio watches we had we had three, three uh, watches, and I was a supervisor. One of them, so I had to right. kind of control the whole place when I when I was on, when I was on duty. We had uh, and 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 we had several well several Marines were in each watch, and then the Admiral. We relieved the the El Dorado was our sister ship. And, had the Admiral Commander Task Force 90 was on there. We relieved them at Incheon, and the Admiral Staff came aboard. And and one of the one of the fellows on the Admiral Staff had I knew him at first as a radio man, first class on the first block island. Then he made chief. Then he made warrant officer. And now he was the chief warrant officer on the Admiral Staff. So that was you know, I hadn't seen him for, for about five or six years. That was that was that was yeah. pretty interesting. See, he was regular, stayed in the Navy all the time. Who was the admiral? Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> oh, okay. Were you aware that were you there at the time of the the Incheon invasion itself? No, this was after. This after. was afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't. Uh, but one thing I didn't know, if you ever heard, they 
the tides, they have tides, they're unusually hot tides go up like, oh, 20, 30 feet or something like that. That was, that was really something rare. You, know, you, didn't, yeah. you didn't see too many places. Did you ever get seasick? I only got seasick once. The first, when I, when I first was in, assigned to the Lexington, and we had to go on, the Lex was in Pearl Harbor, and we went on this transport from San Francisco, San Diego, actually, and we went to San Francisco. And as we got outside of San Francisco, it's very rough outside there, and I'm standing on a, stupidly on the very stern of the ship, watching as the, the coast receded into yeah. the, and the ship's going up and down like <laughs> this, and it was after dinner, just, and we had, I'll never forget, now that was in 19, early 41, we had salmon for dinner that day, and I never liked salmon since then because, oh, I, I thought I was gonna die for about two days. And after that, I, I never got sick anymore. We were in typhoons and hurricanes yeah. and, and, and everything, but that, oh, that was horrible. But I don't know, it was stupid. It probably wouldn't happen if I didn't stay on the, on the very stern there like that. So I, I learned a lesson. Yeah. Stay away from that, the bow or the stern. Try to stay in the middle. <laughs> in Korea, would you say that the morale of the men was as high as the morale in World War II? Well, it's it's hard to say because, as I said, more, a lot of these guys that that, that were, were in active reserves like me, and they, they resented me and called back because they they said why they they have what they call the active reserve guys that do. They, they, they do drills and they do they go on a cruise in the summer and they get paid and they and they said well they didn't call them why did they call us back why didn't they call them back and, and the only thing I could, but so that that you know they, there was a lot of grumbling and, and and they didn't like the discipline and all that but I, I got I got back into it pretty quick but a lot of guys it was wasn't you know they weren't too happy you might say but I don't know what generally overall I don't really couldn't couldn't say yeah. but uh, the only thing I, I can think of is why they called the inactive guys back first was because they knew these other guys had, had some background experience training and maybe they wanted us to get broke in because they thought we might have me into World War III with the Russians, you know, right. it's, it's, it's as I kept thinking about it. Maybe they wanted us to get, well, you guys can get back into shape and then we can grab those other guys later. I, said, I don't know, I never heard anybody really say that. that was, <laughs> One of my theories that I go <laughs> These things go through your head sometimes, yeah. you know. <laughs> Sensible or not. I was wondering what's, what, did the, uh, what did you think and what did other servicemen think about General MacArthur and Truman recalling him? Well, MacArthur was a controversial figure. I think he was like a, uh, his image in his own mind, I think he was almost like next to God or maybe maybe <laughs> above him even, you know, I, I think that he, he was, and he was, he was pretty old, but he, he, he had these funny ideas which could have been right that, that if we're going to beat these guys, the Chinese now, let's do it before they, they come in here and they're, they're making waves and, and, but he wouldn't obey orders and, you know, he's supposed to right. do what, He's in charge up to a point, but the president and, and the, the general, the staff, they're the guys that pull the plays with supposedly more knowledge, but he thought that he knew better than everybody, I guess. So I think, you know, they, he had it. Truman had to do that, in my mind, to, 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 for just for overall general discipline. You can't, can't say he's a general, and he's, but he's not going to say what his orders are. And the, the next guy's under him will say, well, if he could do that, why, why can't I? get away with something and you know I, I that's my idea <laughs> how did you uh, keep track when you were in Korea and also in World War two of the war well I should say in World War two just one question about that were you did you keep track of how the war was going in other areas of the world oh yeah as I said I, I copied the press and made the newspaper so we had we had pretty well you know updated every day what 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 information we could get from I, I, there were several different civilian stations that would broadcast at certain times in Morse code, a very fast uh, uh, press uh, uh, releases of, of, of all around, and I'd try to put them together and edit it out so we knew something besides the baseball scores a little bit. 
have you stayed in contact with friends that you've made in the service? Yeah, as as I said, there's there's two, my two friends. We were both on the Lexington together from from. They, I guess we must have all got on there near the same time in the early spring, 1941, and we we went on Liberty together. We hung around with the three of us, abandoned ship together. We both, with three of us, both got on both Block Islands, and so you know we we were. Uh, I, I got uh, I don't know I got here. Yeah, we we had we ha all had our names tattooed on there like that, uh. and <laughs> it's. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that that uh, uh, that's the only way I recognize this one fella. He he just came to the uh, he just heard of it with the Block Island. We have we have an organization. We've had it for quite a few years, and we have reunions every year. Mm -hmm. Last year we had a reunion in uh, in Roanoke, uh, Virginia, and this guy showed up, Davis, one of these guys, and I hadn't seen him for. He was one who stayed in the Navy twenty some years, and he just heard about it. and He came to the reunion. And the only way I recognized him was we all had short sleeve shirts on, and and he comes over and shaking hands with me. Boy, I haven't seen him. I'm saying, who the hell is this guy? He had, used to have black curly hair, it hung down over. His, now his head is like mine or worse. And and uh, I, I, I only way I recognized him was I saw the tattoo on his arm. <laughs> and and then the other fellow, Rogney, his name is he. Davis had been in t contact with him. He lives in Kentucky now, and he uh, he 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 couldn't make that reunion there. But th this year, this May, we're, we have it in May every year when the ship was sunk, and and uh, we're going to go into Reno this year. And so Rogney, I talked to him on the phone. He said he's going to he's going to intends to come to Reno. So, you know, but that was like 45. That's the last time I saw these guys. <laughs> then there was another character, uh, Woodward R. W. Woodward. He was. Name was we used to call. I called him Skinhead, and he called me Slick, and and uh, so we, even then we didn't have too much hair. But but uh, he was on the Yorktown. I didn't know him then, but yeah. there, during the war. But he come on the first Block Island, and he was probably the funniest guy I'd ever, I ever I ever met. And and he only heard about the the, the organization several years before, and he contacted me. Because when he heard about it, they, they then he then he got in touch with the uh, with the secretary, and he have a roster with all the people's names and phone numbers and everything on. And and he he said he'd been trying to contact me for years and years, but he thought I lived in because I lived in New Jersey when I was in the Navy, and he could try to find out people in New Jersey. Then he found out from this guy that I was up here, so we got together and we had a lot of fun. We we went to. So when we made all the reunions. We shared a room together after with the, the, the old fellow. He, he died a couple of years ago. The old old fart. <laughs> I really miss the old. He was uh -huh. a funny guy. <laughs> How would you say that serving in the military affected the rest of your life? Mm, I don't know. It just made me happy that I got through it. I guess yeah. I I don't really. I never thought about it yeah. if it made any difference. Or, and how do you feel? How do you feel now versus then about the uh, the war effort? Oh, I think I think we did as the, as good as possible. I think that when 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 everything a lot of people were isolationists before the attack. You know, they, right. Roosevelt was trying to he started that lend lease to give your, England all supplies and stuff, whatever they could. A lot of people were against it, but. As soon as the Japs attacked, attacked us, there was almost a, there was no hardly any any difference of opinion after that, and everybody seemed to get them, do whatever they could to get through it. So I think I think it was well done. No matter some a lot of people goof up here and there, no matter what, and take advantage of things. But we were the greatest country in the world then. I don't know what we are now. <laughs> how do you feel about the difference between how um, World War II veterans are treated versus um, Vietnam veteran of uh, Vietnam War veterans were treated when they returned home? Oh, I, I feel bad about that Vietnam War. I, I feel th those poor guys had they did they did what they were ordered to do. They, people people gave them aggravation and all that. That that 
that wasn't their fault. They went there and got killed and wounded and blown up and everything else. And a lot of them weren't lost their marbles, I guess, and they, they never recovered. But I think it's a damn shame that the, the country didn't, even though they, it wasn't a good a good war. But that wasn't their fault. I don't, I, you know, I, I, the, 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 the people in charge were the ones that sh should get the get the aggravation, not the poor guys that had a, that were there getting doing the, doing whatever they had to, were told to do. But you know, that's an opinion from the lower level, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. I wanted to. This is my final question: Is is there one thought or memory you would like to share with the community or future generations? Well, I don't know if this is a, what you what you had in mind or whatever, but I, th I think this. Uh, to me, uh, I'm a big history buff, and a lot of people think history is uh, uh, something that you learn in school. You learn dates and 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 and, and things, and so, so you can pass a test or something. And as soon as you get out of school, you forgot it all, and you don't care anymore. But to me, I think it's history is a. It's it's like a, a story about people's lives and events that 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 uh, shaped uh, civilization, and uh, you might say. And, and uh, I think what what this this program you people have is is a is a great thing, and and I I hope that it'll it'll uh, make uh, maybe some of these people that that don't take interest in history that uh, that maybe. Uh, Give them a, some second thoughts about it, and get them interested, involved, maybe. And and I, uh, I thank you very much for, uh, for her, uh, letting me take part in it. Well, I, I want to thank you for spending your time and sharing your experiences with us. And well, thank you. It's been an enthralling hour. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. Well, I'm glad we could do it. <laughs>